When I saw these guys doing tricks and flips. A skier about to go pro. I learned this new trick uh, the week earlier. Crashes and burns. Unfortunately, I went a little too fast. I overshot the landing. What got him back on the slopes? Plus, married to the mob. They just went right over my head. One mobster's wife becomes part of the family and changes the mafia forever. Well, welcome to the 700 Club and the sadness in Mudville today. You know why? I'm not sure. The hostess company went bankrupt. Oh. The maker of Twinkies. <laughs> and I, I know you wept over that. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. I, I have not eaten a Twinkie, I think, in my whole life. But nevertheless, I'm sure the Twinkie eaters are stoking up. They say it won't let, they won't keep more than several weeks, four this weeks max. This is the second max. time, right? I don't know whether that company has gone in. But anyhow. Who? Interesting. All right. I just thought I'd put that out to get things <laughs> so going. So the rest of you could mourn as well. That's it. You can mourn <laughs> along with it. Well, this man is considered a top religious authority for Muslims around the world. His rulings call for the killing of American troops in Iraq and the destruction of Israel. And that's not all. What's even more frightening is that his influence reaches far beyond the Middle East. Eric Stackelbeck takes a closer look at the Muslim Brotherhood's spiritual leader. Sheikh Youssef al Karadawe has been called the most influential Islamist cleric in the world. Over the past year, he's used his clout to promote the so-called Arab Spring. For Karadawe, the rise of radical Islamic governments across the Middle East and North Africa means a giant step towards his vision of a united Islamic superstate, or caliphate, governed by Sharia law. The 86-year-old Egyptian native pushes this agenda through his website, Islam Online, and his top-rated Al Jazeera program called Sharia and Life, which reaches tens of millions of Muslims each week. Sheikh Yusuf al-Kardawi is more just an ideologue. Uh, he is also a strategist. Walid Faris is author of The Coming Revolution. He says Karadawi sets the tone for the Muslim Brotherhood worldwide. We're talking about a Lenin here, a jihadi Lenin who controls the flow of the ideology, but also give the nod with regard to the general strategic direction. He's the mentor today of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the MBs are about to take over in at least three to four countries in the Middle East. Just one week after protests forced Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak out of power, Karadawe returned to his homeland following a 30-year exile. He led Friday prayers for a crowd of over one million in Cairo's Tahrir Square, where he called for Muslims to reconquer Jerusalem. Ferris compared it to the Ayatollah Khomeini's return to Iran in 1979. Karadawe came to Egypt to change the Arab Spring into a caliphate spring. Karadawi's fatwas, or religious rulings, have endorsed the killing of U.S. troops in Iraq and suicide bombings against Israeli civilians. He's shown a special animosity towards Jews, and not just those living in Israel. During a 2009 sermon, he raged, O oh Allah, take this oppressive Jewish Zionist band of people. Do not spare a single one of them. Count their numbers and kill them, down to the very last one. Genocide. Uh, that's the main message, genocide. Egyptian dissident Cynthia Farhat told CBN News that Westerners who call Karadawe moderate ignore his words. He went as far as saying that he wants to kill Jews with his own hands, with his own bare hands, while sitting on his wheelchair. Yet according to a recent report in one of India's largest daily newspapers, the Obama administration is using Karadawe as a mediator in secret negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban. An Obama administration official told CBN News the report is not accurate. The administration has acknowledged, however, that it is engaged in dialogue with the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist parties. And Karadawi has ambitions beyond the Middle East. He says Islam will conquer America and Europe as well, not overnight, but gradually through immigration and conversion, Pat. Eric, is the White House blind, deaf, dumb, deaf, blind? What is it? They're in <laughs> contact with this man and some of his yeah. people. 
You know, Pat, they deny it. Now, they denied this report. Uh, First of all, I wish I was a fly on the wall in the Middle East meetings at this White House to get inside their heads and see what exactly they're thinking. They deny this report, Pat, but two things here. Number one, it appeared in one of the largest daily newspapers in India, a very credible source, the Hindu. They use Indian intelligence sources many times. It's a very detailed report saying, yes, the U.S. is using Karadawe as a mediator in talks with the Taliban. Number two, Pat, another interesting point here. Uh, the Taliban is apparently opening an office in Qatar. Now, Karadawe lives in Qatar. Very interesting. And the third thing, Pat, is look, the Obama administration is engaged in dialogue with top Muslim Brotherhood leaders throughout the Middle East and North Africa. So if you're in their shoes, why not talk to Karadawe? After all, he is the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, You know, and I know, that the Muslim Brotherhood is intent on establishing the caliphate, putting Sharia law into effect, and of course, obliterating Israel. But yet the uh, administration, I think Hillary Clinton and the president and others, have indicated they're a group of moderates. Where do they get off with that? Well, Pat, great point. As we speak, the number two man, the number two highest ranking official at the State Department is in Egypt, and yesterday he met with leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, Pat, we have Muslim Brotherhood documents. You and I have discussed this on CBN News. We have Brotherhood documents that our own FBI uncovered just 10 minutes from where I'm sitting right now outside of Washington, D.C. In these documents, it says clearly that the Muslim Brotherhood's goal is world Islamic domination and that they want to destroy the United States from within. This is their own words, Pat. Now, our government officials have these documents in their possessions. They know the Brotherhood's game. I don't know, Pat, call me old fashioned, but when someone says they want to destroy my civilization, Mm -hmm. I take them at their word. Apparently this White House does not. Is it stupidity or do they somebody deliberately trying to throw the game? It's tough to say, Pat, (coughs) honestly. This administration has been so pro-Islamist, so anti-Israel, that you wonder what the thought process is. One thing I've heard is that they believe that the Brotherhood has changed its spots, that they're now moderate, that they no longer support violence. And they actually believe they can use the Brotherhood, who are the so-called moderate Islamist, Pat, as a counterweight to al-Qaeda and the really bad guys. But if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood's words, they're still calling for the destruction of Israel. They're talking about breaking the peace treaty with Israel. They will never have dialogue with Israel. And they're supporting the reestablishment. Top Muslim Brotherhood leaders, Pat. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood's very top guy, not only Kara Dawe, who we're talking about, but another top Brotherhood leader just last week said, yes, we are very close to the return of our ultimate goal, the Islamic Caliphate. The Islamic superstate would stretch all across North Africa and Middle East, a union of all Islamic countries, militarily, politically, economically, to take on Israel and the West. They believe the wind is at their backs, Pat, and they're very close. And this White House, frankly, is not helping much. Eric, I appreciate the work you're doing. You're bringing stories that you just don't hear on the news. You're hearing it on our news, ladies and gentlemen, because we bring it to you. He wrote a book that's been very popular called The Terrorist Next Door. It's still available on Amazon and places where books are sold. It's Eric's book. Uh, uh, Some shocking things, but factual. He gets his facts right. Well, you can get the latest updates on terrorism by going to Eric's uh, blog, Stackle Beck on Terror, and CBNNews.com. Well, Lee Webb has the rest of our top stories in the CBN Newsroom. Lee? Pat, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that the government has no right to tell a religious organization what ministerial employees it can hire or fire. The case involved Cheryl Parrish, a teacher fired by a Michigan church school. She sued, claiming discrimination. But the justices backed up what's known as the ministerial exemption, which protects religious employers. And their decision was unanimous. Douglas Laycock represented the church. Disputes between ministers and their churches, if there's anything that's covered by separation of church and state, this is it. These cases do not belong in the civil courts. In the ruling, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, the church must be free to choose those who guide it on its way. But Justice Roberts added that employees might be able to bring other types of lawsuits against religious employers. Mitt Romney is feeling the heat in South Carolina. After a big uh, win in the New Hampshire primary, he's fighting off attacks portraying him as an elitist. Mark Martin has that story. 
With a narrow victory in Iowa and a sizable one in New Hampshire, Mitt Romney is in South Carolina with a lot of momentum. He wasted no time in speaking out against President Obama. I think you have to say this has been a failed presidency. And the former Massachusetts governor's Republican competitors are wasting no time in bringing up controversial issues surrounding the GOP frontrunner. Texas Governor Rick Perry had harsh words for the management firm Romney used to lead. Companies like Bain Capital could have come in and helped these companies if they truly were venture capitalist, but they're not. They're vulture capitalist. The other candidates, Ron Paul, Rick Santorum, John Huntsman, and Newt Gingrich, are also working hard to slow down Romney. Romney signed government-mandated health care with taxpayer-funded abortions. A super PAC supporting Gingrich is spending nearly $3.5 million on ads and a documentary painting Romney as a rich elitist who buys up companies and lays off workers. Romney says that's playing into President Obama's hands. We've understood for a long time that, uh, that the Obama people would come after a free enterprise. Uh, a little surprised to see Newt Gingrich as the first witness for the prosecution. The former speaker says Romney needs to address the eyebrow-raising issues head on. If they think they could get through a general election with Obama and Axelrod and not have to be capable of answering tough questions, um, that's a formula for guaranteed defeat this fall. The South Carolina primary is January 21st, but the GOP hopefuls also have their eyes on Florida at the end of the month. At least 424,000 Republican absentee ballots have been mailed and some 84,000 have already been returned. Mark Martin, CBN News. You know, Pat, uh, for Gingrich at least, and maybe even Rick Perry, this fight against Romney seems to be personal. And if that's the case, you wonder how long they're going to stay in to, to try to bring him down. Well, you have to ask yourself, what is their game? What are they trying to do? I mean, they, they should be trying to win the nomination. But uh, this uh, campaign of hate and vilification uh, isn't going to win them anything. It's not really going to hurt Romney. Romney's going to go ahead and do what he does because he's got the overwhelming uh, financial support and uh, support more and more and more out of the so-called mainstream Republican Party. And uh, what are they doing? Newt was positioned. He could have come in and run a substantial close second. He might even have won South Carolina if he'd done it on a positive basis. But if he's playing this negative card, it's not going to work. And leave the whole idea about Bain Capital. It's very successful. I understand uh, from an article yesterday, I, th I think they have assets of something like $266 billion. They, they have investments from all kinds of uh, nonprofits, uh, university endowments, uh, uh, hospitals and charities and things like that that invest with Bain. And Bain has done a tremendous job. Staples is their uh, number one show that they took a little company and built it up to a, a monster. And I, th I think that's true. But in truth, if you take a sick company, there are times you have to shut them down. I mean, there just is nothing else you can do. And yes, that means people lose their jobs, but uh, that's just capitalism. It's, you know, Schumpert had called it creative destruction. You just can't leave uh, the walking wounded around uh, all day long. There has a time that you have to say, okay, guys, we've put all the money into you we're going to, and we have to shut you down. Well, any good VC, any good uh, venture capitalist will do that. And that isn't vulture. That's just the way the game is played. And I'm shocked at Rick Perry. He knows better. Lee? Pat, after a 10-year drought, the San Francisco 49ers finally had a winning season and made it to the playoffs. Much of their success this season is thanks to a top-ranked defense led by linebacker Patrick Willis. But he doesn't buy into the hype. Here's sports reporter Sean Brown. San Francisco 49ers linebacker Patrick Willis is one of the most dominant defensive players in the NFL. When teams call a play, he's the guy they try to avoid. As the Niners advance to the playoffs for the first time in a decade, Patrick says he's not letting it go to his head. I still respect those who played the game before me, and I also know that I didn't get here by myself. I didn't do it on my own. And I feel like if it was a good Lord who put me here, it was a good Lord who, who blessed me better to be able to do what I do. I don't want to go and brag and say, oh, yeah, it's me. Oh, look at me. Here I am now. Duh, because just as he blessed you with it today, it could be gone tomorrow. Patrick's grandmother was a big influence on his life. And through her, he learned about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
While growing up, she always just, you know, told us about faith and always like put us in the church. I never forget uh, my uncle um, was was my uncle Arthur was a pre professional boxer. He would always tell me too, you know, he would always just be like Patrick and say, no matter what you do. Like this when I was young, he would say, no matter what you do in life, no matter how good you do in sports, he said, just always remember to give God all the praise, glory, and honor. When Patrick joined the 49ers five seasons ago, they were a losing team, but he never doubted that's where God wanted him to play. He remembers the prayer he prayed just before the draft. I said, Lord, you know, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. I said, I've done everything I could possibly do to put myself in the best situation. Wherever you bless me to go, that's where I'm going to go, and that's where I'm going to make a home, and that's where I'm going to give everything I got. That's where I'm going I'm to I'm play the best football I can possibly play. I say, Lord, so whatever happened on this day is, is in your will. The 49ers face their first playoff game this weekend. And Patrick says no matter the outcome, his number one priority is to glorify God. I just go out there and, and I always pray. I say, Lord, I don't know what today's game is going to be like, but I just pray. I pray that you bless me and go out here and, and play for you. Be a soldier for, for your army. Be, um, go out here and lead this team the way you want me to, to lead it. So each time I play, I don't want to go out there and say, um, tell the people, I'm playing for the Lord today. I just want them to see it and know that when I, whether good, good, bad, or, or and definitely know I'm playing for the Lord. And that's why I'm able to just be like, you know, like, man, today wasn't a good day, but just thank you, Lord, for blessing me to be able to play this game. Although today wasn't a game I, I was uh, hoping I had, you know, but I'm just blessed to still be playing this game. He's a terrific player too, Pat. You know, Tim Tebow is getting a lot of, of attention, and deservedly so, but it is so encouraging to see so many players in the National Football League who love God and, and want to play for him as well. Well, uh, the 49ers are coming up against Drew Brees and the Saints, and I think, uh, you know, despite uh, Patrick Willis, I think the uh, 49ers are going to be struggling against Brees. He is so good, but here again is somebody that loves God. It's wonderful to see these, as, as you point out, these, these professional athletes, the top of their game, and uh, covered with adulation from fans saying, I give the glory to God Almighty. Terry? You're here. Well, coming up, how the nation of Haiti is recovering two years after its devastating earthquake. And then later, we're going to be taking your questions from our chat room, so send us those questions at CBN.com right now. Thanks. Something inside of me just told me I need to get checked out. The doctor said we found something and we need to get into surgery. Beth Gomez had stage three colon cancer. That's when we scheduled an appointment for a second opinion at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. To find out more about treatment options for complex and late stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com. You'll be able to see our treatment results for many types of cancers and how they compare to national averages. You can also check for participating insurance plans. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, every resource, every one of us, everything we do every day is focused on you, our patient, your treatment, your healing, your survival. You had a whole team. I wasn't just going to fight this battle. They were going to stand beside me and fight it. Our physicians, clinicians, and nurses are highly experienced and dedicated. We use state-of-the-art technology and give you treatment options you may not even know exist. Cancer makes you really appreciate what's important in your life. Please call or go to cancercenter.com today. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Tomorrow. The skater began to just freewheel backwards off the hill. A logger who made a split-second decision. I decided just to bail off. The wrong one. My feet apparently slipped and I and I went right under the, the front wheel. How he lived to tell his story. I could feel a lot of you know, things moving around and, and so I knew I was internally hurt real bad. On tomorrow's 700 Club. Well, it was one of the world's greatest tragedies. Two years ago, a deadly earthquake shook the nation of Haiti killed more than 300,000 people, left more than a million homeless. Well, it's not over yet. They haven't cleaned it all up, and survivors are still trying to recover from the massive uh, uh, tragedy. And as we understand from one story, the uh, so-called, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, of, of the name you would call them, but the uh, uh, independent organizations that are trying to do help have run out of money 
And as Efrid Graven uh, reports, uh, CBN's Operation Blessing is still working hard to help them restore their nation. As signs of Haiti's earthquake slowly disappear, the Haitian people grow stronger, thanks to organizations like Operation Blessing. Well, the last two years have been just flat out. We've been working nonstop um, on relief projects, on development projects, saving lives after the earthquake. I mean, we lost count of how many lives were saved from the doctors we brought in. That includes bringing medical teams from the Mayo Clinic each month, administering anti-parasite medication every day, and tackling the country's water crisis. With the introduction of cholera in 2010, uh, it, it became a crisis. You know, it's still today, Haiti is the, lar the world's largest cholera epidemic. And so clean water is essential. It's probably the biggest need for the nation right now. While water is an immediate need, Operation Blessing is also focused on the future. Workers have recently built a school here in this small village. In a very remote village, it's one of the poorest villages that we've found in Haiti. And so you have the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, the poorest village in that country, let's say. It's just extreme poverty and need. And Operation Blessing is, is moving beyond just providing relief items. The look on these kids' faces when it comes to getting that education and being taught, I mean, there is no comparison anywhere I've seen in terms of just the excitement of, of being there. Absolutely. When we first went to this village, it was a very different story to what it is now. Um, extreme malnutrition, the, a lot of the children weren't even wearing clothes. I mean, it was just about as bad as you could get. And so to see now where they've come, just in the few years we've been working there, it's, it's amazing for us to see, and of course, wonderful for all, for all of them. It's just one example of the community development projects Operation Blessing is working on throughout the country. Another is these little guys that make up the organization's aquaculture project. The tilapia that we're growing are a very resilient fish. Tilapia come from the Middle East. Some people say that they're, you know, the loaves and fishes. It's the biblical fish. And so it's a strong fish. It's very fast growing. And, um, you know, it's perfect for Haiti. It's perfect for the Haitian environment. And so that's the fish of choice. These 150 feet long and 40 feet wide aqua cells are growing even more tilapia these days. And even more importantly, they're producing jobs. In the city of Port-au-Prince, we have aqua cells, which are essentially just large fish ponds, uh, where, which have very high densities of tilapia fish in them. So we're growing high volumes, 25,000 fish in one of these aqua cells. And so that's one model of aquaculture that we, we're using it as, a, as an example to show what's possible in Haiti. They need to see where they can be at. And so we're, we're, we're creating the Aquacel Project as a model of development for Haitians, for the Haitian government, to see what is possible in the country. Looking to the future, Operation Blessing is still in Haiti. Lots of organizations have left in those two years. Does that now increase the burden on Operation Blessing? As different organizations pull out, it certainly increases the burden on the organizations that remain in Haiti. Uh, there's always work to do there. So the burden is tough anyway. The burden led to a partnership to build orphans a home in Croix de Bouquet. It's called Zame Beni. Zame Beni is Creole for blessed friends, and this home is indeed a blessing for little guys like this one here and some 49 other children. And believe it or not, this facility started with just one building. Orphanages are being shut down because they're, the conditions are terrible and then there's more orphans in circulation and we're now being asked to absorb some of those children into our facility, just as an example. Um, as money dries up for di different organizations and they leave different areas, there are still needs that aren't being met. And so Operation Blessing is perfectly positioned to be able to respond to emergency needs and the development needs, the infrastructure development that is so essential to the nation. And so we're just calling on our supporters to back us, to enable Operation Blessing to be a lasting impact in Haiti. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Thanks, Ephraim. Incredible. Uh, Bill Horan, the head of Operation Blessing, and uh, I guess I'm chairman of it, but in any event, I'm very pleased with the work that Operation Blessing has done in Haiti, and, and they're making a lasting impact uh, on the country, and Bill Horan is very interested in fish, and this aquaculture uh, project is just dramatic. These tilapia, they're, they're good eating fish, and they just breed like crazy, so they've got all kinds of fish down there that 
they can put on the market so these people will have some protein in their diet. It's, it's very wonderful. And folks, by the way, if you want to participate, um, you might just send something on this one to Operation Blessing Haiti. You could say, uh, this is for Haiti. I have a burden for Haiti. Uh, <clears throat> we've been able to give away through Operation Blessing at least, I don't want to overstate it, but it's at least $250 million, maybe more, um, to help all kinds of people do all kinds of things. And uh, Operation Blessing just doesn't go into a country and uh, get a few uh, uh, sound bites and some uh, film clips and go away. Uh, it stays, and it stays and puts down some roots and does something good. Signs of the Times, we'll give you this as our gift to you if you join the 700 Club or if you make a gift um, to this Haiti project. Operation Blessing. Terry? Well, up next, meet a real-life mob wife. Cami Franzese tells us what it's like to be married to the mob, so don't go away. Here at CBN, we see amazing things happen when we stand together. That's why we want to say thank you to the thousands of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club. Your monthly gift makes it possible to bring crucial help to those who need it most. You help heal the sick, feed the hungry, and preach the gospel across America and throughout the world. You've brought health and hope to people in desperate need. And changed their lives forever. Young Sun Sun was beaten by his abusive father since he was a small boy. When their house was destroyed in an earthquake, Sun Sun left his home and built a mud hut to live in. That's when you rescued Sun Sun, building him a new house and providing him with warm meals and an education. You changed his life and gave him hope for the future. So please, watch for this mailing and send in your pledge. This year, millions will know the love and saving power of Jesus Christ. And that only happens because you were there. Hello? Hey, handsome. The McCann Twins for Consumer Cellular. Where are you? On the street. I got a new cell phone from Consumer Cellular. They're all the same. Not true. They're complicated. Uh, but expensive. I... Long-term contracts. Cancellation fees. My plan is just $10 a month. $10 a month? I didn't have to sign a contract, I, there are no cancellation fees, yeah, and I even got a free phone. And when were you going to tell me about this? Call or go to ConsumerCellularTV.com now for no contract plans starting at $10 a month, a free phone, and a 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee. Shipping is free. Let's call and get your free phone. Consumer Cellular is the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members who get special benefits and discounts. My first call. Hello? Hey, ugly. <laughs> Call 1-800-368-6425 or log on to ConsumerCellularTV.com. There's a new show out called Mob Wives. They, they had something called Rig Growing Up Gotti, and they seeming to there's an incredible interest in people that are in what are called organized crime or the mob. Well, Fortune Magazine called Michael Francis one of the top 50 mob bosses. Life Magazine called him the, quote, mob's young genius. But the woman you're about to meet knew that mafioso in a much different way as her husband. Cami Franzis married into the mafia without even knowing it. I mean, there were a Anaheim. little, a few innuendos, but they just went shoo, right over my head. Her husband, Michael, was a member of a New York City crime family. He reportedly set up brilliant financial scams that netted him millions of dollars. After they were married, Michael went to jail for his crimes, twice. In her book, This Thing of Ours, Cammie shares how she unknowingly changed the face of organized crime in America and the key role she played in Michael's decision to walk away from his life of crime. Well, you know what the, the La Cosa Nostra is our thing, and this is the, the, the thing of ours, is what uh, Tammy's book is. And it's a pleasure to welcome uh, uh, the wife of a Mob boss, former mob boss, Cammie Francis. Cammie, good to have you with us. Thank you, Pat. My pleasure. Hey, listen, you married Michael. He's a good-looking, attractive <laughs> guy. And uh, did you know about all that mob connection when you married him? Oh, no. Gosh, Pat, no, I had no idea. Uh, I uh, didn't find out much about Michael's life until we were well married. 
uh, mm -hmm. and had a few children, and he was writing his first book. And I stumbled upon a couple of notes in our home and read a few things that frightened me. Mm. And then that was it. I uh, sort of turned a bl blind eye and didn't mm. want to read anymore. Well, you, you know, you think of a, of a mobster as a big jolly Italian, you know, with a cigar yes, <laughs> and eating do. pasta with a big glass of wine. Michael doesn't fit that picture. I mean, he's good looking, smooth and very articulate and very smart. Yes, he definitely is. And he, uh, he definitely doesn't fit the typical uh, mobster look when you see the guys. I, I mean, I know a couple of the names. I mean, when I used to hear them, like a couple, one that comes to mind is when you're saying big guy, I think his name was like Fat Tony Salerno. Yeah, and, right, and, right. You know, he'd have the big cigar. But uh, no, I think that's why uh, they called Michael the yuppie Don, because he was he was a different a different kind of mobster. Well, uh, he, he went to jail, though. I mean, was that after you all? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. We were married. Um, for not that long, and he went to jail for the first time for about four years, and then he came home for, uh, he wasn't even home quite two years, and then he went back for another almost four years. Come on. Yes. I mean, he, it was four years? In, 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 yes. For what? What did they get him for? Uh, the first time he was racketeering and uh, all, all kinds of other things that, uh, and the, the, main, the main one was racketeering, which you can get, you know, up to 20 years for that. What does so. that mean? Racketeering, truthfully, I'm not really sure, but from what I know, it's just a, a, a bunch of crimes that were committed at the same time. Yeah. Um, and they kind of put them all together and, and call it racketeering. I'm, I'm still not really sure what, what it all meant. Did, did they get him tw twice for the same thing? The second time was a violation of his parole when we were yeah. living out in California because, you know, he was under such a watchful eye and any little thing that he did um, was not okay. And in... And, 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 to be honest, the second time when he came home, he was sort of cutting corners here and there, which he shouldn't have been doing. Um, and well, they took well, him. What does and it they mean? They, him, they cut corners. You know exactly what he was doing. You know, I don't know, but for instance, um, I know he was involved with with a company who was doing loans and mortgages, and he shouldn't have been in that business. Okay. You know, in the first place. So things like that, things of that nature. Is Michael a financial genius? Is 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 that the deal? I mean, you know, handling books and and stock and all that. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely think he he is a genius. I mean, anything he does, he does well when he puts his mind he to like it. He didn't like the rough stuff, or did he have to get involved? You know, when he was younger, he he claims he works cons he worked construction for a lot of years yeah. as a young kid, and then he worked in a, a pizza place making pizzas. But no, he's a he's a thinker. He's a smart guy. Well, he, had you get uh, a foul of the law, they got you too. They did, yes. Uh, that was uh, heartbreaking and a really uh, difficult process for me. But because I was his wife and because um, we were involved in things together and, you know, the, some of the things that went on and one of the things, like I said, he did was signing my name to something and, oh, you know, wow. and I was not aware of any of this. So when, when, when I did get arrested, I was completely I mean, overwhelmed. Was one of those confrontations where you're screaming and hitting him or did you just sort of say, okay, he's my husband and no, that's what No, I was screaming. <laughs> you were I was screaming. I was so <laughs> distraught, Pat, that I couldn't, I couldn't go visit him because I didn't even know what I would say to him. I was just so bewildered. Um, and I think it's then when um, God really spoke to me and said, you know, you, you, didn't put me first in your life and uh -huh. you put Michael first. And I, my mother warned me that, you know, Michael loves you and he's an amazing man, but Michael will fail you because he's human, but God will never fail you. And you That's need great. to put God first and foremost all the time. And I think I did for a long time. I had Michael on this pedestal that mm -hmm. he could do uh, no wrong, no matter what he did. And yeah. this was a game changer for me. Um, and I know like, you know, a, this would have never happened if it were in New York, but because it was LA and they were looking to make, the detective was looking to make a name for himself. Uh -huh. Michael was the big fish in town. So he came after me to get Michael to do what they wanted Michael to do, which he said he wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, so they figured, let's go after Cammie. And uh, that was tough. That changed a lot of things for me. You know, it really sort of changed our relationship because I, I sort of lost trust and it took 
time to gain that back. It's terrible. But it was terrible. How, because, how long were you in the well, job? Well, I was, I was only in there for a couple of days, but it oh, was, was just, right? it was horrible. You know, I mean, my children were at home, and mm -hmm. thank God my nanny, who never spends a night, slept over that night, so I, she was able to keep the children. Well, were, you, were you raised Catholic? Your grandmother was Catholic? Or my grandmother was Catholic, my mother was Catholic, and then I became, uh, my mom became a believer when I was around 13. Uh-huh. Um, just and then seeing how God had worked in my mom's life through a difficult time that she was going through with my father at the time when he was an alcoholic and seeing the peace um, that she had, I just felt like I wanted, I wanted and did, needed did some of that. You were turning to the Lord, bring Michael along, or was he finding it on his own? No, Mike. Um, you know, Michael was a Catholic, so he oh. always um, he was a believer. But he just didn't know about relationship. He never had a relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, and he, when I met Michael, when he shared with me about being a Catholic, and he was the only one in his family who went to church, um, and I shared with him about my faith, he thought he thought it was kind of funny how I would have conversations with God, or always talking about just yeah. leaving God's hands, or you know, God will come through, or God will take care. So, mm -hmm. but uh, it's incredible. You know, I, I asked him when he was on with me, I mean, how do you get out of the mob? And you, you don't normally do it except it's in a pine box. How about you? How did they let you go? Uh, you know, I mean, yes, that's what they say. And that's why I believe that Michael is a walking miracle. You know, only, only by the grace of God is he here because God had a different plan for Michael. You know, God's plan when, you know, Michael's verses, when... Um, he talked about walking away and, and what it would mean for him to walk away. Mm -hmm. And I said, with God, anything is possible. We can do this. You know, and, and my mom was like, we will pray you through it. Our church was praying for us. Um, and really, I mean, people, we get asked that question all the time. So only, only by the grace of God is he here. And well, the people still after him or they let it go? No, I, I, don't, I don't think they are. I mean, the sad thing and the unfortunate thing is I say this because I feel for all of the families that mm -hmm. have gone through this. You know, um, the ones who would be after him or don't like him are either serving life in prison or <laughs> dead. are dead. And so, you know, and I just think, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> he's protected in that way. Sure. I mean, you know, there could always be someone who just a nephew, a grandson who wants to make a name for themselves, maybe, but I don't really think so. I think, I think they've sort of given yeah. up on Mike and know that he serves a different You're master now. You're strong now as a, in a marriage. It's good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have, you know, we're, we have our struggles. I mean, we have the, the, the consequences of, of the past 25 years and the choices that Mike made and we made over the years. I mean, there's, you know, we, we deal with that still sometimes because it's the past doesn't mean that it doesn't show up in your house sure. every now and then. What do you do for a living? What does he do for a living? He's uh, a motivational speaker. He's yeah. written about four books. Um, he's uh, sharing his story all over the country. Um, just uh, his, his passion is to be in the ministry 100% if God will allow him to do that sometime soon. Um, um, and he's done a couple of TV shows. So he's got a lot going on, but his, his priority is to just uh, serve God. Yeah. Well, we thank God for you, and I hope this book. Where can people get your book, by the way? Uh, they can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. All right. This Thing of Ours. Yes. La Cosa Nostra. This Thing of Ours. Do you go into detail about how it was? Or you kind I, of, do. You I, I, I do. I go into a, a lot of detail about, uh, you know, life with Michael in the past 25 years, <laughs> and a little bit of my story growing up, which God mm -hmm. sort of prepared me for this life with Michael because my father was a little bit of a rebel as a young girl growing up. So I've had a little bit of, uh, of schooling sure. um, with that. But yeah, I mean, it goes in when I first really, really got a, a, a good look at what Michael's life was really about and um, just the feelings of dealing with that and, and, and children and the repercussions yeah. of the life. And Incredible. how, you know, my mother plays an important part of the book because she was the prayer warrior from day one. Well, you're so young looking. You got four kids? I have four children, yes. How'd you stay so young? And uh, well. Yeah. Good genes, maybe. Is it, yeah. <laughs> Cammy Franchise, uh, is it Francis? Franzies. Franzies. Cammy Franzies. Okay, well, there it is. This thing of ours, and you can get it where books are sold. Cammy, God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You're Thank terrific. You. Thank you so All much. Right. Terry, what's next? Well, still ahead, a world class skier who hit the slopes and then hit his head. I learned this new trick uh, the week earlier. And uh, it involved, you know, two and a half, three rotations and flipping and 
I went off the jump and uh, unfortunately I went a little too fast. I overshot the landing and uh, I was knocked unconscious. But that wasn't his last crash. Hear how he recovered when we return. When the publisher's clearing house sweep things. <laughs> Watch your mail for the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes or go to PCH.com and enter. This February 29th, you could win $1 million every year for life. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. A federal court has ordered a Rhode Island public high school to remove a prayer mural from its auditorium. An atheist student sued Cranston City and school officials there. She claimed the mural promotes religion and is offensive to non-Christians. City officials, though, say the mural is a historic, historical artifact and serves no religious purpose. But a federal judge ruled in favor of the student, ordering the immediate removal of the mural. The Episcopal Church has won another property battle with breakaway churches, this time in Virginia. A judge has ruled that the denomination can take back several historic churches. The most famous buildings include Truro Church in Fairfax and the Falls Church, for which the town of Falls Church was named. Both trace their roots all the way back to George Washington. The buildings are still occupied by breakaway congregations that left the denomination over its increasingly liberal theology. The conservative congregations are considering an appeal. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Do you have wrinkles and sagging skin? Would you like to remove years of aging from your face in about an hour? Now you can with Lifestyle Lift. This amazing procedure takes about one hour right in our office. See the difference immediately. No general or IV anesthesia. Return to your activities quickly. Call now and get this informational kit free. Financing available. Lifestyle Lift. America's experts in making you look younger. It gave me back all of my confidence. Call now and get this informational kit free. Falls are the number one cause of injury to senior citizens. Acorn Stairlifts has a solution. Just don't fall. Sit, relax, ride with an Acorn Stairlift, the world's leader in stairlifts. Don't let limited mobility keep you from going up and down your stairs, even outside. Call Acorn Stairlifts now for a free information kit and no obligation quote. Why risk falling? when you can safely ride. Our Acorn Stairlift is definitely more affordable than moving. The Acorn Stairlift has a padded seat and backrest, safety sensors, stop the chair if there are obstacles. The seat swivels and locks so you don't twist your body. And the Acorn Stairlift folds away. It even works through a power shortage. I was really surprised at how little they cost. Call 1-800-505-3513 for free information. That number again is 1-800-505-3513. 1-800-505-3513. Call now. Anaya Kirk is the type of skier you see flying down the Black Diamond Trail or twisting his skis in the air like a propeller after launching himself off of a snow dune. Anaya lived for the mountains and the ski slopes. It was the only place he felt free. Growing up, Anaya Kirk found his sanctuary in the great outdoors. I grew up in a small town in California by uh, Yosemite. So naturally, me and my brother and my father, we, uh, we spent a lot of time outdoors, backpacking, skiing, basically anything everything you could do outdoors I did. Church was also a centerpiece of the Kirk home. We went to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. I always looked forward to uh, the, the summers. We did youth retreats. And for me, that was kind of where I discovered God. But when Anaya was 14 years old, his parents divorced, and Anaya's faith in God was shattered. My mother didn't just get divorced, she, you know, she left the church that I had been brought up in. So when she left, to me, it wasn't just like a divorce, it was kind of like a religious split, you know, right down the, right down the core of who I was. I started to doubt the things that had been instilled in me as far as God and love and relationships. To escape the problems at home, Anaya shut down emotionally and hit the ski slopes. It was just my outlet to, to get out of the house, 
to go up on the mountain, whether I was with friends or just by myself. And I, I saw a bunch of skiers going off jumps, you know, that snowboarders went off of. And to me, it was a whole new concept. When I saw these guys doing tricks and flips. And During his teen years, Anaya became one of California's top half-pipe skiers. His big break came during his senior year in high school, when he placed 13th in the U.S. Open at Vail, Colorado, against 200 of the nation's best skiers. Suddenly, sponsors were at his door with the possibility of contracts, a professional skiing career, and the chance to travel the world. At, at the back of my mind, it was, you know, if I go pro, I could be in magazines, I get girls galore, you know, the party scene. So that became my focus, and that was, you know, in a sense, I was my idol. Anaya eventually moved to Mammoth, California, a bustling ski town where he pursued his professional career. He also had a serious girlfriend and a carefree life off the slopes. But it wasn't long before Anaya's dreams came crashing down. I got up just like a normal day, uh, headed out to the, to the slopes, and um, I, I learned this new trick uh, the week earlier. And uh, it involved, you know, two and a half, three rotations and flipping, and I went off the jump, and uh, unfortunately I went a little too fast. I overshot the landing, and uh, I was knocked unconscious. It was Anaya's sixth concussion. When his symptoms lasted longer than normal, doctors told Anaya he couldn't ski for a month. Three days later, Anaya was drinking at a party and got involved in a fight. I was jumped by about three or four guys, punched in the head, I was knocked out, I, um, just blindsided, knocked out, kicked in the head, and then thrown down some stairs. He was taken to the hospital where tests revealed a hemorrhage. Neurologists told Anaya he couldn't risk another head injury and that he could never ski again. And when I told one of my main sponsors, you know, what had happened, um, I, was, I was three weeks away, three or four weeks away from, from signing a contract. And they basically said, well, this looks like the season's over. So when they told me, we'll look at you next year, I, I basically knew right then and there, I, I lost my chance with this. Just days later, Anaya caught his girlfriend sleeping with another man. And it was the very first time in my life I'd actually even, I'd thought about suicide. I lost everything in one week. And I'd never, I'd never been so low in my life. It was worse than my parents' divorce. And I put my head down on the kitchen counter and I just, I started bawling. Through his tears, Anaya saw a family Bible that he hadn't opened in years. Well, I saw the word Holy Bible. And I, I basically had a word with guys, you know, I'll, I'll give you one chance. I'll open up your Bible, I'll open up your word, and if you talk to me, I'll consider you, but otherwise, if you don't talk to me right now, I will never open up, I will never open up this, this word again. When Anaya opened the Bible, he felt the words were speaking directly to him. And the Lord was just basically told me in a nutshell that, hey, I want you to come home. You've, you've given your cares to this world and you've given your, your life to things that, you know, that don't really matter. And uh, I love you and I want you to come home. So I was able to get through that night. I woke up the next morning and uh, I, was, I thought it was pretty cool that I opened up the Bible and he actually spoke directly to me and it made sense to me. So I opened up the Bible again. And uh, this time he talked about uh, the prodigal son returning home. Anaya felt God was calling him to return to his hometown but he was still hesitant. I, for the first time in years, I just spoke out loud to God. I said, God, if you really want me home, the only reason why I'm here is because I'm trying to save up money to get a better car. And as soon as those words left my mouth, my, my aunt called. And she said, I don't want you living in a mammoth. If you, if you come home, I'll give you the car that's in my garage. So I turned around, I didn't even go to church that day, and I, I packed my stuff and I headed home. Anaya went to church his first Sunday and started attending a men's Bible study. During that time, a friend prayed with Anaya. It wasn't what he said, but it was the, that, that overwhelming love that's, that really um, started to take place. It felt like a blanket was thrown over me. I knew there was a God. I knew He loved me. I knew He had a will for my life, and I wanted His will for my life. And so when I walked, I walked away that night, um, totally changed. In 2007, Anaya married Amy, a longtime friend from his hometown. Today, he is a counselor for prison inmates and still skis for fun. He's also written a book called The Life I Always Wanted, telling the youth of this generation about his passion for seeking Christ. There's just been an overwhelming peace and overwhelming fulfillment in my life. Uh, there's things that I'm doing now that I never thought I'd be doing. My message to my generation is basically we pursue anything and everything trying to find fulfillment in life. I search for everything whether it was relationships, whether it was girls, skiing being popular, and 
my message is no matter what you chase, no matter what you pursue, you will never be fulfilled until you open the door to Jesus Christ. Anaya is really right about that. You know, he did a very right thing in the midst of his chaos. Sometimes life is, is like that. You know, you get to a point where everything's going. It's, it's easy to not consider God. It's easy to not take him seriously when everything's going your way. But then you have those times where life just kind of seems to implode and you're just almost stunned by the blow of it all or the emptiness of it all or the disappointment of it all. The right thing Anaya did was he turned to God. He might not have done it with all of his heart at that moment because he wasn't ready, but he did the first step. He said, I'm going to open your word. I'm going to turn away from bitterness and anger. I'm going to turn to your word. And I'm asking you, God, to speak to me. God wants to speak to you. He said, I love you to Anaya. Come home. And that's what God's saying to you today. I love you. Your circumstances, your past, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at you. And I want you to be my child. I want to be your dad. I want to be there for you, give you what you need, love you in your hurt places, fill you in the empty places, give you a vision for who I am and who you are in me. Who wouldn't say yes to that? Today, you have a chance to do that. God's saying, I love you. Come home. So come, come, take the first step. This is what happened with Anaya. As he read the word, he realized that everything he'd known about God that had gotten thrown away because he was disillusioned or hurt or didn't understand was real. And that even though he had moved away from God, God had never moved away from him. And God's not moved away from you either. This moment, this day, this story, what you just saw is God's hand extended to you saying, I love you, come home. It begins with asking him, inviting him into your heart and your life. He doesn't come barging in. He's waiting for you to say, I want you. It's already a given that God wants you, but will you want him today? Ask him. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. Ask him to cleanse you, to give you the new beginning his word promises. Get into his word. It's filled with wonderful promises of God for all of us if we'll receive them. So receive him, receive the promises today. And if you've got a need in your life or you want somebody to walk you through this and pray with you, see that toll-free number on our screen? It's available for you today. It's 1-800-759-0700. And there's someone on the other end of that line who's waiting for your call and would love to pray with you. We've got all kinds of wonderful materials to share with you that are free as well. So call now. Pat? Thanks. Our lines will be available all day long. Even if this program isn't on the air in your area, you can still call up. And it's toll free. Somebody loves you. Well, coming up, your questions from our live chat room. Sarah says, I feel God has given me an idea. I want to start my own business, but where do I start? Well, we'll tackle that question and more on today's 700 Club. on the line, but at home, they struggle to connect. You've been a good enough father. I want to be a good enough father. On January 17th, honor begins at home. Courageous on Blu-ray and DVD. Time for some questions from our chat room. Pat, this is Sarah who okay, says, go. Pat, I know you started CBN from nothing, so you know something about starting a business. I feel God has given me an idea, and I really want to start my own business. I think I'm able to get a business loan, but what do I do first? How do I put together a business plan, and where do I go from there? Oh, my, my, my. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you that in a couple of minutes. 
But the big thing is uh, you have to have something that people want. And what do they say? Find a need and fill it. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to satisfy a need at a profit. You have to sell something uh, for more money than it costs you to make whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a service or whatever. I would recommend you start small. I mean, wherever you are, I mean, whatever it is you want to do, instead of going out for a business loan, yes, you can do a business plan and you put down um, the resources you need, how you're going to deploy them, uh, you know, how many people are going to be working, you figure out how much profit's going to be. Um, sort of like the architectural rendering for Exactly. Your that's, yeah. that's what a business plan is. It could be very simple. Okay. But I, I mean, the, there are books on this, lots yes. and lots of books. Yeah. And, and online, you, I'm sure you can sure. get all kinds of How to start a business. But I, I just say start small. Would you say that's the biggest mistake most people make is they go too big too soon? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they don't know what they're doing. All right. Next. Sarah, there you go. Cherie says, Pat, yesterday you said pornography is not adultery and it's not grounds for divorce. divorce. Yet in the book Bring It On that you wrote, it is. Now I'm confused. Which one is it? Um, it's uh, a question of how much time I have to think when I write a book and how little I have to think when I answer, <laughs> I answer these questions. These questions. <laughs> well, also, I think you, you were saying also that technically, well, I mean... We're, it's we're the, talking about divorce, mm -hmm. and if you catch your spouse watching pornography, is that reason to divorce him? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a type of adultery? Yes, in a sense, with your mind. But uh, you're lusting after a woman with your eyes, so Jesus said that's an adultery, so technically. But I think the question that I had on this program was, is this grounds to go get a divorce? And I just don't think it is. I don't think, I don't think because your husband or wife is watching porn that you ought to divorce them. Right. I think you have to also take that even a little bit further with regard to the divorce question and say, does he eventually work to getting out of it? And well, sure. I mean, I don't think you stay in a scenario where exactly. that becomes the core. Well, if, if somebody's just totally given over to it, I mean, it's the type of addiction that, that all right, but, but huh, you caught me. Thank you. <laughs> this is Elaine who says, I filed for divorce because my husband left me and refused to reconcile. I never cheated or did anything terrible. Do I have to stay unmarried? to be a Christian? I don't think so. Your husband deserted you. There's something called the Pauline privilege, which says if the unbelieving spouse is pleased to depart, let them depart. The brother or sister is not bound in that case. And so that's desertion. Your husband has deserted you, left you, and through no fault of your own, and you're not bound in that case, according to the Apostle Paul. Okay, have we got time? Uh, this is Lois who writes, My daughter has a good career. Her husband doesn't. He won't work hard or help pay the bills. How can she be a submissive wife when he doesn't care about the home? Wow. You know, it, it really breaks me up to see very capable women who are married to men who are, uh, instead of class A, they're class D, and they, they don't want to perform. The problem is that really isn't a ground for divorce. And... Uh, you, you, you married him, and so I would just counsel people to be more cautious before you take on a life partner. But at the same time, uh, your daughter can go her own way with her own career without the fact, the fact that her husband is not participating. That's she tough. She probably has to if there's well, yeah. a family. Yeah. Well, here's a word for you. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's all the time we've got. We'll see you later. And remember, big doings next week. From CBN. An adventure for the whole family. <laughs> Give it back. Ooh, make me. Do something. <laughs> Get Superbook and start the new year learning the truth of God's Word. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, Roar, the story of Daniel, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of $25. Anyone who prays to any god or man except to the king shall be thrown into the lion's den. Your membership means the fun and learning keep coming every month. With your continued support, you'll receive three copies of each new episode. It was almost like he didn't care that he was going to get thrown to the lines for praying. Superbook DVD Club. It's a wonderful way to build a strong spiritual foundation in the children you love. 
in a way they'll love to watch the whole year through. Superbook Roar, the story of Daniel, available now.